question real quick? Pardon? Just the, has a K in there instead of H. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Cindy Edwards, president of Bias Design Digital Marketing Group and the chair of the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's Forum Onslow. The Governmental Affairs Committee works with government agencies on issues that affect our business community. We monitor legislative issues that impact local business, and we promote partnerships between business, government, military, and education. The purpose of these forums is to create awareness on topics that are important to our entire community. That's why our corporate sponsor, Duke Energy Progress, has partnered with the Chamber to provide these forums for many years. They understand the importance of informing constituents. Mr. Bob Dupuy, Duke Energy Progress Federal Account Executive and Division Chair of the Chamber's Military Affairs Committee, and Millie Chalk, Duke Energy Progress District Manager for Government and Community Relations, and a member of our Chamber's Board of Directors, were unable to attend today, but they send their sincere thanks to the candidates and to the citizens who are attending the forum, as well as those who are watching by television. We'd like to thank our media sponsor, The Daily News, the City of Jacksonville for the use of these facilities, and the City of Jacksonville Media Services for broadcasting this very important forum. I would like to turn the podium over now to Christopher Welch for introductions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Welch. I'm an attorney here in town with Welch and Harris. We're a general service law firm located here in Jacksonville. I was asked to briefly give an overview of the office that's the subject of today's forum. Uh, the participants in today's forum are running for election to represent the 16th district in the North Carolina State House of Representatives. Each member of the House serves a two-year term, and elections are held on even-numbered years. There are a total of 120 members of the House, and the House itself is led by the Speaker, who is chosen from amongst the elected representatives. Each House member represents a separate district from within the state, and the 16th district is composed of portions of Onslow and Pender counties. The State House meets for one regular session per year. In odd-numbered years, they have a, what's called a long session, which convenes in January and typically runs for approximately six months. And in even-numbered years, the legislature meets for a short session, which typically lasts much longer, perhaps only six weeks, although there is no legal requirement as to how long any given session may last. In addition, the governor has the power to call the legislature back into session for a special session if business arises after the legislature has adjourned, which requires their attention. In order to qualify as a member of the House, a candidate must be at least 21 years old, must be a qualified voter within the state, and must have resided within their district for at least one year prior to their election. The gentlemen here today are candidates of their respective parties and are facing off in the general election, which will be held on November the 4th of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, my name is Elliot Potter. I'm the publisher and executive editor at the Daily News here in Jacksonville. And I also have been doing these forums for a few years. I really can't remember how long, but it's always been a lot of fun and, and really interesting. Um, Today, our, we have, uh, again, candidates for the uh, House, State House Representatives District 16. We have uh, the Republican candidate, Christopher Millis, and uh, we have the Democratic candidate, Stephen Unger. And so I really want to thank both of you for participating today and making the trip into Jacksonville uh, to do that. We, uh, again, we want to make this uh, informative, as entertaining as possible, and I want to spend a few moments now going over the rules that we'll use for the evening, uh, both for the audience participation and for the candidates who are participating, um, so that we can make that happen. Uh, we will have ways for the live audience to participate uh, in asking the questions. Um, folks in the audience and those watching or listening at home are welcome to send questions uh, during the forum to g10 events at ci.jacksonville.nc.us or they can tweet them to at g10 events uh, hashtag forum onslow and that information should be appearing uh, on the screen we also have an opportunity for people that are here uh, actually here at the, in the audience uh, participating at the city council chambers today uh, they can write their questions or comments on a card and and hand them to me and what i'll attempt to do uh, during the course of questioning is work some of those in as many as I can 
so that we can uh, maybe have some participation from uh, from others. Um, I would ask those that are submitting questions. I will be presenting the questions to both candidates, so they shouldn't be directed at any one person individually. Uh, we have also tonight asked each candidate to submit a question of their own that I'll be posing, and both have done so. So we really appreciate that as well. Uh, let me briefly go over the format. It's pretty simple, one that we sort of tweaked about um, you know, maybe a year ago. But it, we kind of like the way this is working because it offers some opportunity for candidates to uh, have limited rebuttals. Uh, I will be presenting the questions. You will have one minute to respond to each one of the questions that I represent, and I will alternate as to who goes first. Uh, if I don't get it straight, I'll try to straighten it up as soon as I can. Uh, but if you, um, if you have, after the, after the complete round of questions, after both of you have answered, if one of you would like to uh, spend 30 more seconds on that question, either to, to elaborate on what your comments were or to uh, perhaps to rebut something maybe that the other speaker said, uh, you'll have 30 seconds to do so. Please hold up one of the green cards in front of you to let me know. And again, you'll have 30 or three times to, uh, to do that and 30 seconds for each rebuttal. Uh, at the, the, the conclusion of the questioning, you will each have two minutes to, to give a summation, up to two minutes. Um, and the other things, sort of a basic rules of engagement, if you will, uh, this is a forum, it's really not a debate. So I'll pose the questions and you answer them to me rather than cha challenging and debating each other. That's, uh, that's what we have done um, historically here, and, that, and it seems to work. Uh, we also ask you that you adhere to the time limits. Uh, at 10 second mark, you will get a yellow light in front of, you, of, of the table here. And uh, so at that time, you want to start really winding to a close. And once you see the red light, we would ask that you just complete your sentence that you're on and stop, even if it may sound a little abrupt. We would rather have that abrupt ending than you know, the look that maybe somebody's taking advantage of the time situation. So please uh, participate in that. Um, so again, I, the, well, I'll get ready for the first question and that'll be sort of giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, do you have any questions about the format today? All right, well then let's get started. And I will pre present the first question to, uh, to Mr. Unger. Please tell us, and, and then after that, Mr. Millis, you will have a chance to respond. Uh, please tell us something about yourself, where you reside, a little bit about your experience, and also tell us what motivates you to run for a seat in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Well, thank you. I live in the Slough Point area of Pender County, which is actually close to the Onslow County line. Uh, I currently work for the town of Surf City. I'm athletic program specialist and I'm responsible for the sports programs for both youth and adults. We have over a thousand participants at this point. I also started a wellness program there. Um, I am a graduate of Kalamazoo College in Michigan and also received a master's from Nazareth College in Michigan. Um, I worked in the media business for quite a few years. I was editor and publisher of Topsail Voice newspaper, so I was community involved through that aspect. Um, then I, later I went to work for the Wilmington Family YMCA, running their sports program, later came up to Surf City. Um, I'm running for office because I felt it was very important that there be a choice in this election because our viewpoints are different on many issues and the best thing was to let voters know what we stand for and at that point they can make an intelligent decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Millis. Uh, yes, sir. Let me first begin by saying it's been a tremendous honor to be the representative of the citizens of the 16th District in the State House for these past two years. To give you a little bit of background about myself and what motivates me to be here before you today, I was brought up, born and raised in this district. I attended our public schools from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. I went off to NC State University where I had the opportunity of graduating valedictorian with a degree in civil engineering. Upon graduation, I came back to live in the district where I've been raising a family with my wife and our two children. I've actually worked as a civil engineer and from life experiences as well as my profession, I began to see early on uh, that I was upset and uh, frustrated about the direction that our state and nation was heading. A direction away from our founding principles, a direction away from the proper role of state government, 
in a direction that would not have the opportunity to provide the privileges to our children and our future generations. As a result, I decided to step up and to not do what most politicians do. Instead of caring about the next re-election, I'm here to care about our next generation. Thank you both. Uh, Mr. Mills, next start, uh, we'll start with you on the next question. There has been considerable debate among people on both sides of the aisle politically about the direction in which North Carolina is heading. How do you assess that direction and do you find yourself in general agreement or disagreement? Well, I stepped up because, again, just like I expressed, that I was uh, frustrated in the direction the state was heading. Uh, prior to going into office in 2011, our state had the 46 worst tax code in all the nation. Uh, for the first tax reform that's happened in this state in over 80 years, we've taken a tax code that was 46 all the way now almost in the top 15. When I came into office, we had uh, state employee and teacher pay scales that were frozen due to fiscal irresponsibility of previous administrations. Uh, this past session, we were actually able to unthaw the teacher pay scales that have been frozen for some time and actually institute one of the largest pay raises in North Carolina history for our teachers. Also, in addition to the invisible tax of improper and unnecessary regulation, we've been able to chip away at those things that is basically harming our individuals and private property rights. We have a responsibility to protect our environment, but we've been able to do so in a manner that's more efficient and more effective, allowing individuals greater opportunities to prosper. I'm pleased in the direction we're heading, but there's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. Mr. Young, I'm going to re repeat the question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been considerable debate among people on both sides of the aisle politically about the direction in which North Carolina is heading. Um, how would you assess that direction, and do you find yourself in general agreement or disagreement? Well, one reason I decided to run is I, I totally disagree with Chris. I think we've been headed in the wrong direction for the last three or four years. Um, we have done things that are counter to the environment. We, uh, we are exploring fracking right now, which is, will be a devastating impact uh, just to recover uh, natural gas. Uh, our educational system has been riddled with problems. Uh, we've eliminated Common Core uh, or attempted to. Uh, we've had a $500 million shortfall that we've tried to balance on the backs of education. Uh, we are 48th in teacher salary. Um, I'm also, in terms of jobs, uh, we need to preserve jobs, including the 5,000 plus jobs that the film industry is about to lose uh, to other places because of the non-renewal of film incentives. So because I don't agree with the direction the state is headed, I decided to run. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, gave both of you an opportunity to submit questions to us, and you did. And I'm going to uh, read Chris Millis's question first, and I'm going to pose it to you, Mr. Unger. Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Millis, you will have an opportunity to respond. Our North Carolina Constitution upholds the traditional view of marriage as a union between one man and one woman, as recently approved by the majority of citizens of our state. Despite the fact no court has found North Carolina's marriage amendment to be unconstitutional, the city of Winston-Salem has recently begun to recognize same-sex marriage as a city policy. If elected to the state house, will you support traditional marriage as the union between one man and one woman as defined in our Constitution? And will you fight to defend the people's voice if legislative action is needed to stand against same-sex marriage? I believe in marriage equality. I believe in the, the right of, of males and females to marry each other or males and females to marry same sex. I believe that this right is protected under the U.S. Constitution and that will be determined by the Supreme Court in short order. The most recent decision of the Court of Appeals uh, in Virginia has overturned uh, things like Amendment 1 in North Carolina. Um, I believe that it's important to have equal rights for all citizens. Um, this is something which has changed in terms of public perception over the last generation. I think it's, it's already on its way. And uh, the traditional form of marriage, that's fine, but I think anybody who wants to get married should be able to get married, and I support total marriage equality. And I've been endorsed by NC Equality, a group supporting this concept at the state level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller, you wrote the question. I can repeat it for you, but uh, how about if you want to go ahead and respond? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Uh, as a citizen, I supported the marriage amendment when it was on the ballot in 2011. Uh, it is actually a move that's not taking away liberty, it's not taking away rights, but it's actually defining the very essence of the fabric that our nation and state has been built upon, and that is the actual uh, foundation of the family. Uh, I was not alone in my vote. 60% uh, of North Carolinians also supported the traditional view of marriage between one man and one woman. As a result, if I get the opportunity to return to Raleigh and to fight on your behalf, not only will I stand up for your rights, not only will I stand up for your liberties and what you've said by way of the ballot, but I also will fight against lawlessness that is happening uh, within our own, uh, our own city here in our state. If given the opportunity to go to Raleigh, I'll continue to fight for your voice and I'll continue to stand for traditional marriage. Mr. Unger has indicated that he'd like to use one of his three rebuttals now, so. I think it's important we extend constitutional rights to all citizens, regardless of sexual orientation, uh, regardless of how you were brought up. And I think in, in having that kind of right is more important. Um, I think uh, to deny the right to marriage equality denies, denies rights of all kinds. It denies rights of being able to visit your spouse, legal documents, other things, and I totally support marriage equality, and I believe that's the way of the future, and that's the way it should be. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question comes, uh, was written by Mr. Unger, and I will present it to you first, Mr. Millis. Uh, what is your position on fracking and offshore drilling uh, two methods of increasing oil and natural gas production in North Carolina and offshore of our state. Yes, sir. Uh, very clearly, um, there is no thing that I would stand for that would undermine our protection of our environment and the beauty that we have here as a state for tourism, but also won't stand in the way of science and technology to be able to harness our natural resources, to drive down energy costs and, pro and provide prosperity for the citizens of this state. Your state has been heading in a manner to allow the technical experts to explore hydraulic fracturing and to make sure before the first well is driven in the state that we have protections that are going to make sure that the public is protected. There's been over 2.5 million hydraulic fractured wells established since 1949. This is not new. North Carolina has actually gleaned from the good regulation-wise from other states and we're actually going to institute a way that we can harvest our natural resources and provide prosperity in a way that is environmentally sound. In regard to offshore drilling, we're just now beginning to explore uh, from an actual exploration standpoint what resources we have, and I'll continue to be a voice on what we need to do uh, to the federal level in regard to this is actually achieved. Okay, Mr. Unger, I'll let you tackle your question on uh, fracking and offshore drilling. Well, as I said before, we're the number one producer of natural gas in the world in this country. Um, we should be looking at expanding our renewable resources, hydroelectric, solar, wind, instead of looking at ways of possibly hurting our environment. Uh, frac fracking has got a bad record. Uh, it's said that there's no such thing as clean coal. I'm saying there's no such thing as clean fracking. It creates problems wherever it's done. Um, and I went to one of the public hearings in Sanford on this and addressed this subject and found that 90% of the folks who attended the hearing not only are concerned about the safety standards about fracking, they don't want it at all. And we don't need it in North Carolina. And we need to be looking at renewable resources. Uh, offshore drilling, we don't need derricks out there. We don't need the possibility of, a, of an oil spill. We don't need to follow our waters. Our recreational fishing and commercial fishing industry is too important to risk that, and I totally oppose offshore drilling. Thank you. Mr. Potter, can I do a rebuttal, please? We you sure can. Uh, we have a rebuttal uh, coming from Mr. Millis. Yes, sir. If you listen to what's actually shared here today, we have aspects of coal that we depend on and we're actually moving in a way to actually clean that up. We have aspects of natural gas that's supposed to be an alternative to coal. And then now we say that that's not actually what we need to use. We need to use renewable energies. You have to understand that this state has the only mandate and subsidy of any state in the southeast for renewable energies. Now, I'm not against wind. I'm not against solar, but I'm against using your tax dollars to subsidize it and also to have high rates of power. Power costs is a tremendous burden upon our senior citizens. It's a tremendous burden upon industry. And we need to make sure we're upholding our environment, but to do so in a way that is smart and efficient and is actually providing the opportunity to prosper by clean energies. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna switch now back to, uh, to questions posed by 
myself. We've had some input uh, uh, from some other from some people that have submitted questions earlier, also from our Chambers Governmental Affairs Committee. So, uh, sort of a collaborative effort here. Uh, Mr. Unger, you'll get a shot at this one first. Okay. Hmm. Uh, there are so many issues in the legislature today that are regarding education. Uh, we hear a lot about teachers' pay. We hear a lot about funding issues, charter schools, Common Core. Which of these issues ranks most prominent in your mind, and why? I, I think they're all out there. Uh, let's talk about charter schools first. I think 20 years from now, we'll look at starting and funding and expanding charter schools as a big mistake. Uh, Michigan just finished a, a 20 years of charter schools, and studies have showed that they do not improve student performance across the board at all. What they do do is line the pockets of those who are running the charter schools, and they make the money. Uh, I do believe that we have cut, that by cutting back class size, by eliminating teacher assistance, by eliminating tenure, those are all moves in the wrong direction for education. Uh, the recent pay increase of 7% is only an average. Our, our long-time teachers got almost nothing, and they're, they're leaving the schools. We are still 48th in terms of teacher salary. Um, we've got to look at things as a whole, and right now it doesn't look good for the public education system. And every time we divert money to the charter system or we use vouchers to send money to have students attend private schools, it takes away from a public school system. Thank you. Mr. Bellis, would you like you to repeat the question, or I, I will do that anyway. How about that? Uh, just for the benefit of the audience. There are so many issues in the legislature today that are regarding education. Uh, we talk, people have talked about teachers' pay, funding, uh, charter schools, and Common Core. Which of these ranks is most prominent in your mind, and why? Oh, yes, sir. To, to start off, uh, I think the most prominent thing we need to look at is actually being efficient with the resources that we're putting towards education, not only for the teacher, but for the student and the parent, as well as the taxpayer. We're funding about $8,500 per student per year, and we all know that that's not making it to actually instruction. There's a lot of bureaucracy that is soaking up those funds. It's being detrimental on behalf of the student. Uh, as an individual who went through our public schools from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, there's no question that I have a focus on reforms to actually provide better opportunities for our traditional public schools. But we have a constitutional obligation to provide the privilege of education. We do not have the obligation to provide a monopoly. Uh, it is important that we provide a competition so all individuals can rise and do better. Our charter schools are public schools as well, and they provide opportunities for other individuals who may not be as fortunate to be in a great school district that we have in the 16th district, and there's no way that I can stand against their freedom to choose and their freedom to actually have the money follow them instead of having for them to follow the money. Thank you very much. Any rebuttals? We got, we're clear to go. All right. We're clear. We're very, you know, we're both there. <laughs> um, Mr. Mills, you'll get first crack here. Would you support providing Unzo County with the option for an additional sales tax to fund school construction? And uh, in answering that, please give us your overall feeling about sales taxes as a source of revenue. Yeah, in, in regard to give the overall feeling, it's, supposed to, it's, it's first to say that you know, property taxes are one of the most egregious forms of taxation you can have. And when you have a sales tax, it's actually a little more use oriented. But we also got to be very careful that we don't send residents and individuals away from our point of sale and from away from our cash registers. We might make sure we have to have a proper tax burden. Uh, this issue, uh, Mr. Potter, came up very briefly in the short session. I'm looking forward to actually having the Onslo County representatives and different uh, county commissioners inform me of the need to look at this. Uh, to provide the opportunity for the citizens to vote on this matter is something that I'm definitely open to. But again, I need to be presented to the case of why this is needed and why any time you look at increasing one's tax burden, you want to do so with, with, with major caution and major prudency. So I look forward to the arguments expressed by the local county here, and I'm willing and I'm open to listen. Mr. Unger, I'm going to repeat the question for you. Would you support providing Unzo County with an option for an additional sales tax uh, specifically, it's been discussed to fund school construction. Uh, what is your overall feeling about sales taxes as a source of revenue? Well, here's where we actually have some agreement. Sales taxes are aggressive. Um, the, they should be used really for only short periods of time for specific things and specific projects. Um, so I'm not real happy about happen to institute a sales tax, but if an area wants to uh, tax itself and really needs it, 
the bottom line is we should have had more money for school construction in the first place. The lottery funds, which are supposed to be for school funds, have been diverted. Some have went to teacher salaries, but some have been used to balance the budget in the General Assembly. And we take this money away and we're looking at these terrible bond issues. Uh, Pender County's got a, a bond issue exceeding 70 million that's going to add seven cents to their property tax. So we need to take a look at it, putting the money where it belongs instead of having to come back and, and come up with means like sales taxes to fund things. And it may be the necessary evil here, but it's not the ideal way of funding school construction. Thank you. I want to pause for just a second here to thank both of you for paying such close attention to the time limits. It really makes, the, makes everything uh, happen a lot better and fairer and uh, without us getting involved in it. I do, have, I do want to recognize our timekeeper from the chamber. <laughs> Uh, Teresa Carter, who actually heads up our uh, county tourism division, so she's doing a little moonlighting today. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but I do want to thank you again for adhering to the time limits. It's a big part of the. It's an important part of what we're doing here. Um, and I believe, Mr. Unger, you are first for the next question. And and it's a pretty simple one. What can the legislature do to improve and expand jobs in North Carolina? Well. I think we're going to have to offer incentives. We're going to have to look at, at tax incentives and other means of bringing in major industry. Um, we also need to take a look back at the film industry here. It, it employed over 5,000 people in jobs statewide. That's an incentive that suddenly has been pulled out and um, is going to end at the end of the year, and that entire industry is going to disappear. So. We've got different kinds of things we need to look at for different kinds of industries. Yes, let's try to land a big auto plant. Let's do things. It'd be nice if we could say, hey, it's level, and we're just not going to offer any incentives at all, and that's not the role of government. But in this modern world, if we're going to attract major industries, major new industries, we need to take a look at offering incentives. And in the case of the film industry, we need to look at restoring the incentive that, that they had, or it's bye-bye. Mr. Billis, what can the legislature do to improve and expand jobs in North Carolina? Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, by a low and uniform tax burden, by further regulatory reform, and actually spending taxpayer dollars properly within the government's proper role by way of education, infrastructure, and those aspects. But anytime you have government that takes your money by force and spends it outside of its proper role, it's harmful for the individual because people know how to choose, how to use their own dollars Better than, better than any bureaucrat or any elected official. We need to provide ways to have economic growth, and economic growth is allowing people the freedom to choose. Remember, we went from the 46 worst tax code in the nation to almost now in the top 15, and we did that by actually providing a low tax burden for all individuals by getting rid of the loopholes and carve-outs for special interest. Quit allowing politicians to pick and choose who actually prospers and who doesn't provide a low tax burden for all so that all will have a greater opportunity to prosper. I believe the citizen knows better how to spend their own dollars than any elected official. Mr. Unger has indicated he'd like to provide a rebuttal. Yeah, I, I'd just like to make the observation that by cutting taxes on the wealthy and cutting taxes on corporation, we ended up with a, a shortfall of greater than $500 million in the in the General Assembly. And then we had to find ways of cutting it. And we looked at social programs. We looked at Medicaid. We looked at education. So taxes do have their role. And this system of trickle-down economics of not taxing when it's appropriate simply doesn't work. It didn't work in the Reagan administration. It's not working now. It didn't work in Kansas. It's not working in North Carolina. And I believe uh, Mr. Millis has a rebuttal to the rebuttal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, we did not cut taxes on the rich. We lowered the tax burden for each and every individual. Before in this state, you actually had to pay taxes after the first $2,000 earned. We increased that to over $7,500 per person and $12,500 per household. You pay zero taxes on that amount. We also took a progressive tax structure that was 7.75, 7, and 6, and had a flat fare rate of 5.75. We did all this. This is far from the truth. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to, uh, Mr. Millis, you get the first crack at this question, and I'm going to tell you that it's a little bit related to what we just asked. Uh, what is your position on incentives? Do you believe in offering incentives to prospective companies to locate North Carolina and specifically address what your feelings are about the recent changes in the incentive program for the film industry? Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, uh, whenever you had the 46 worst tax code in the nation, there's no doubt 
that you actually had to bribe individuals to be here. We no longer have that. Uh, that is very important to realize. Uh, first and foremost, I believe in incentivizing to create an environment where jobs can grow. But I do not believe that the government has to take the right to take your money by force for the role of government and then hand those dollars outside of government's role to a private business. A low, fair tax burden for all. It is proved by theory, application, and history. It provides greater opportunities for all people to prosper, not just special interest. In regards to the film tax credit, it does not mean that they get 25% write off on their taxes. The film tax credit means that they get 25 cents for every dollar they spend in the state, above and beyond any taxes paid. I'm more than happy to offer an amendment, which I did, to provide the same incentive for all individuals, all businesses, and all sectors of our state economy that was done by the film industry. But I will not allow one special interest to be able to take from you by force. I want all individuals to prosper, just not uh, picking and choosing. Mr. Unger. I think you need to look at things differently in different sectors. You can't say, we're going to just create this rule and it's going to apply to everybody. The, the film industry, when you refer to the film industry, you're talking about numerous jobs. You're talking about uh, people working in lighting, technicians, camera people. You're not talking about saying, hey, it's the film studios, all these big evil uh, studios that are, that are making the money. This money goes to um, employees the, this whole sector of the economy. I think you look at different sectors of the economy, you got to look at incentives differently. You got to be willing to be flexible. You got to be willing to offer tax rebates. You got to be able to offer whatever incentive is necessary to bring major industries in and you need to be able to be innovative in that solution. If you say one size fits all, I'm sorry, that doesn't work in North Carolina. We have a rebuttal from Mr. Millis. Uh, yes, sir. I just want to make sure the public understands one important fact, and that is every single study that examines the film tax credit of giving 25 cents for every dollar a f the film industry uh, produces. Again, uh, an incentive that no other individual gets in this state. Every single study shows that it's losing dollars for the taxpayer besides the only study that's actually been funded by the film industry themselves. Our own fiscal research department, who are nonpartisan economists, say that it is, there's no question that we're losing dollars, and I will not take money from you by force and lose it by uh, picking one individual over another. Okay, and we have another rebuttal from Mr. Unger. I'm going to pass on it because I think I need to use it later. Let, okay. Suffice to okay. say, we disagree on this subject, and there are studies out there that show different things than. Okay, well, the, if you're going to use it now, you're going to use let's it. Just, let's just okay. pass. Thank you. All right, you're going to hold on to it. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let's, uh, I believe we're going to uh, Mr. Unger with the first question, with this question. North Carolina prides itself as the nation's most military friendly state. Yet many local governments and military, in military communities find themselves in unique situations that require money to resolve. What should the state's role be in helping these community, communities handle the additional pressure on uh, things like transportation, utilities, and schools? That's a tough question. I'm going to have to get more up on that. but. The way I look at it is that um, we've got to look at the infrastructure that's necessary to serve these populations. Um, we're going to have these bases here, hopefully, uh, for some time in the future, and we need to supply those towns and those cities with, with the roads, uh, with, with help for public projects, with making life livable, um, and we need to look at what we can do at the state level. The other thing we need to do is we need to continue to lobby at the national level to see that um, we don't end up on the chopping block and that our, our bases don't disappear or go someplace else. We need to show why our bases work here and why they work well and how they service the, the public as a whole. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mills, that was a little bit of a long question, so I'm going to repeat it for you. Um, North Carolina prides itself as the nation's most military-friendly state, yet many local governments and military communities find themselves in unique situations that require uh, money to resolve. What should the state's role be in helping these communities handle additional pressure on things like transportation, utilities, and schools? Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, there is no question that we have been chipping away so North Carolina can continue to be one of the most military-friendly states uh, in the nation, not only for our military residents and the actual economic prosperity that it provides, but also to, to the existing citizens that call 
those uh, areas like Onslow County home and uh, the actual peripheral. We need to make sure we're having proper communication between our local elected officials and those in the state. That's the reason why I'm here as your representative. As issues arise with infrastructure, as issues arise with actual tax burden uh, due to property taxes or anything that's unequally yoked, that's the reason why you have uh, representatives on the state level that you can reach out to, that we can have open lines of communication and provide the proper reforms that may need to occur. Uh, my door is always open and I'm always uh, looking forward to the opportunity to converse uh, that we can actually uh, look at how we can provide uh, those needs within the proper role of government. Like your question articulates, it speaks about infrastructure, it speaks about educational needs and things that opportunity, and that's what I'm here for. Um, Mr. Millis, you get the crack at this question first. Uh, it pertains to another um, economic uh, engine for our District uh, 16, the coast. Uh, many coastal communities are facing tough decisions about whether to spend money on beach renourishment projects or continue to watch as their shorelines erode. Coastal residents and property owners note that the beaches are used by people across North Carolina and wonder why only local taxpayers should fit the bill. What do you think? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, one of the big reasons why I actually went to Raleigh. And uh, this past session, I was able to work with uh, colleagues on authoring two pieces of legislation. Uh, one that I'm the primary sponsor of, and that is, is that in terms of beach renourishment, we've had the wrong policy of taking sand that's introduced from the middle of the ocean, putting on the beach, that same sand rolls off, fills in our inlets, and then we're having to fund it on a separate side for a dredging. We need to actually be efficient with our taxpayer dollars. The same sand that rolls off our beach and fills in our inlets needs to be pumped back on there from a dredging aspect. I had a bill uh, that's actually called Ensure Safe Navigation Inlets. It actually allows us to move through a regulatory process to actually take that same sand in the inlet and put it back on the beach to be prudent and get a two for one when it comes to taxpayer dollars. Not only that, we established what's called the Shallow Draft Inlet Fund where the state can come alongside local governments and help with these dredging projects. Because while the federal government has relinquished their financial responsibility of our inlets and waterways, they have still upheld the regulatory authority. So I've been chipping at it from both sides, the Thank spending you. side as well as the regulation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Unger, I'm going to repeat the question for you. Mm -hmm. Coastal communi communities are facing tough decisions about whether to spend money on beach renourishment projects or continue to watch as their shorelines erode. Coastal residents and property owners note that the beaches are used by people across the state and wonder why only local taxpayers are footing the bill. What do you think? Well, I'd like to thank Chris for doing a good job in this area in his, uh, in his in, in office so far. Um, I've been covering the issue for about 20 years and we have been taking out the sand from the inlets as it's washed in and putting it back on the beaches. It may not be in an organized fashion, but that's exactly what the Army Corps has been doing ever since I came here 28 years ago. Um, we need to look at the partnership between local government, the state, and I know the feds would like to walk away, but we need to keep pressure because everybody uses our beaches. There isn't another solution other than retreat, and right now what we want to do is, is keep those beaches open for visitors, for residents, they are, they are, they are our lifeblood. Uh, and the coastal communities need to be protected. And the only way to do it is right now is with renourishment projects. And we just have to find ways. I know the town of Topsail Beach has been particularly innovative in putting the, together their own project uh, with state funds that will also result in them keeping the inlet open and maintaining it themselves. So we need to look at innovative projects like this for other areas too. Thank, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Unger, you get this question first. Uh, the governor recently unveiled his administration's vision for a 25-year transportation program. What ideas do you have about how the state can fund its long-range transportation needs, and should we be looking beyond the current uh, gasoline tax? Well, we're going to have to start by looking at the gasoline tax because it hasn't been increased in a long time and uh, we've got more fuel efficient vehicles out there and we're not generating enough to make it work. Um, we can take a look at tolling roads and toll bridges and stuff. I just, I just don't like that. I don't feel comfortable. We do that. States that do that, people drive around, they, they avoid it. We're just going to have to take a look at increasing the gas tax. Um, we're going to have to look at uh, prioritizing projects 
let's take a look at what's most important versus what senator or what house member lives in this district and therefore they get this shiny highway in the middle of nowhere so we need to be able to look at this from a nonpartisan standpoint and and take a look at what projects are really needed for instance a cape fear skyway across the cape fear river bridge that was a boondoggle i'm glad it didn't get built instead we got to look at ways of getting the bridges replaced that are falling apart and keeping our highways up so that we maintain our role as the good road state thank you Mr. Billis, uh, let's talk. We're talking about the, uh, the governor's recent 25-year transportation program that he unveiled, I think, last week. And uh, what ideas do you have about funding that kind of long-range program? Should we be looking beyond the current gasoline tax? Yes, sir. Uh, you are correct. The governor did unveil a plan by way of headlines, but we are yet to know the actual details. The only thing we know is that. He's wanting to look at bonding $1 billion. Now we have to think about, when we're looking at bonding aspects for infrastructure, is that we have to service a debt. And as we pay for the actual interest on that debt, it takes away from other aspects of the role of government, whether it's education, justice and public safety, things that's important. So we need to be very careful about any further increases in public debt. In regard to the gasoline tax, we are the one of the highest gas taxes in all of the nation. There's no way that we need to look at increasing that uh, by any means. It's very un unresponsible to actually have a gas tax that align your neighbors. You divert individuals to go across state lines, and it's not responsible. Uh, the solution to this is very simple, uh, to focus government spending on its proper role. When I went to Raleigh in 2013, uh, the, the committee I was a part of, we were actually funding a nonprofit for attorneys. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to actually have funding within government's proper role. Infrastructure is that and debt and higher gas taxes is not the solution. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Millis, you will have uh, the opportunity to um, answer this question first. The, um, the recent economic downturn uh, brought some new financial pressures on the state's community college system because it brought a lot of students into the system itself. Uh, should the uh, state try to be working on finding additional funding for community colleges? Well, again, we've already done that by way of the uh, last two budgets that's been passed. Uh, we, we recognize that uh, there is not necessarily a one pathway for all individuals for higher education. Uh, that while some of us may be suited to go uh, and be college bound, uh, that we need to actually respect career pathways and actually respect from technical aspects. And we've done that by way of legislation, but there's still much more to do. Uh, not only providing that other pathway for other individuals to pursue our community colleges, but to continue to build on the foundation to make sure that they're financially uh, solvent and able to actually provide careers and, and, uh, and uh, pathways to actually be able to continue to build our workforce. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous uh, integral part of, uh, of our state higher education, uh, not just from a public university standpoint, but also for our community colleges. We, we, we still have work to do, but we've done a lot of good work in the past two years. Um. Mr. Unger, I'm going to repeat the question. The, the recent so. economic downturn brought new financial pressures on the state community college system through increased enrollment. Should the state find additional funding for community colleges? Well, we've got a lot of students now who wish to attend community college that might have gone to a four-year program before and they just can't afford it. Or the competitive pressures of trying to get into a four-year school such as University of North Carolina or NC State are far greater than they once were. So we've got students who want to pursue their educational opportunities. Instead, they're looking at our community college system as a way of getting started. Yeah, we're going to have to make this a priority. We're going to have to take a look at um, different community colleges offering different areas of expertise. Uh, we've got to fine tune some of this. Uh, we may even need to decentralize. In Pender County, uh, we've got two campuses, now one campus that's, that's being constructed, uh, one campus, the satellite campus in Burgaw, and two campuses in, in New Hanover County. By decentralizing some of this, I think that can also help to save costs. But community colleges must be a priority uh, from a funding standpoint. Thank you. Um, we're kind of working, to, working our way toward the end here, but I do have a few more questions for you. Um, what steps, if any, should the legislature take to provide greater transparency in state and local government? Mr. Unger, you're first. Well, we've got a very good open meetings law, open meetings law if we don't mess it up. Uh, we need to take a look at, in the last session, uh, 
the legislature almost passed a bill that would have restricted access to um, people who run the charter schools. Uh, I think open government's the best government. As a former uh, editor and publisher myself, uh, being able to g get information through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, for uh, the ordinary citizen to get information, we need to be transparent and open. The more meetings that can be held in open committee, the more s sessions can be held in open session, uh, it's, it's just good government. So I believe that this kind of transparency needs to extend to all levels of, of government whenever possible. Thank you. Mr. Millis. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this aspect is something that's tremendously important to my heart as well, of upholding my constitutional obligation to the citizen to actually have openness and transparency. And I can tell you that the State House is a people's house. Every committee is open to the public. Uh, there is audio uh, that's recorded. There's video that's recorded. Every single time that I use your voice and use your vote, you know exactly how I stood. Uh, not only that, uh, I provide constituent newsletters weekly while we're in session, as well as a constituent-based website, so you can have further information about what is going on with your state government. We've done some actually good things in the past 10 years in this state. We've actually uh, reformed the ethics requirements to make it a lot more accountable for elected officials to actually divide the, the aspects between special interest and in, in your state government. Uh, there's some reforms we probably need to continue to look at, but I can tell you that I've actually seen how open and transparent it has been. I'm willing to listen on any other reforms that may need to happen, but I'm actually very encouraged as a citizen on how this state operates. Mr. Unger has indicated he'd like to have a rebuttal. Uh, just a brief rebuttal. Uh, I'm going to take it back to the, the, the fracking issue. Um, we didn't hold any public hearings on that. We just went ahead and wrote the rules and said, okay, now comment. I think a, a lot of measures have gone through the Republican-controlled uh, House and Senate uh, with a lack of, of, of public hearings and a lack of input from the general public. And I think that's just as important as the transparency uh, that he and I have both talked about. Thank you. Mr. Potter, a rebuttal, please. I think you used all three of yours. Okay. Sorry about that. I was keeping tabs. I thought you, you got how much two. money you got in your pocket. No, I'm just, <laughs> it's um, not going to happen. <laughs> we're good to go. Uh, thank y'all for both of the good use of your rebuttals there. Um, you have, you do have the crack at this question. Uh, the states have, have a huge role in patient protection and, affordable, and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, should the legislature be working with the provisions of that program or should maybe it be trying to prevent the implementation in North Carolina? Well, let's, let's be very clear here. The Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is a federal piece of legislation. Uh, if, if individuals want to expand Medicaid, if individuals want to expand certain aspects of coverage, that responsibility belongs at the federal level. Uh, I was not elected in order to take state tax dollars to actually balance the books of socialized medicine. That's what was actually uh, the federal government wants the states to do. The federal government wants the states to expand Medicaid, so they use your state tax dollars to help them balance the books of a flawed policy. Now again, if it's a federal law, let them implement it from a federal level. We're not going to stand against what the federal government may do. But again, I'm not going to tether the state and your tax dollars to something that's irresponsible and wrong. That's not what I was elected to do. It's a federal law. Let it stand as a federal law. Let's not get coerced into what is the federal government's uh, legislation. And the people can decide on the federal level uh, what they think is best for the state, whether it's economic freedom and access to health care or socialized medicine. I would take the former. Mr. Unger, the question is, the states have a huge role in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Should the legislature be working with the provisions of the program, or should it be trying to prevent implementation in North Carolina? Well, folks who keep shouting repeal, 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 I think they're on the wrong track. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is here. It's done a lot of good. Uh, it's created some problems, but we're still working on it. I, I, I actually support its implementation. However, in North Carolina, we have not used the uh, Medicaid expansion that's available to all states, and those states have used it, have been able to enroll a lot more folks and bring them under the insurance programs. Um, I think that that Medicaid expansion it was being financed at least for the first few years by the federal government. It wasn't anything we had to spend. So um, I think that we need to take a look at what positive results that we are getting from the Affordable Care Act and what positive results it will bring to our society in the future. Thank you. Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to wrap up the questioning with that, and uh, we'll switch over to the summary. But before we do, 
I want to say that uh, I think this program today is exactly what this forum has been intended to be, as both of you guys have done a great job of bringing out some of the issues that are prominent in this race. And uh, with that, I will, uh, Mr. Millis, I believe Mr. Unger had the first question, first crack at the first question, so I'm going to give you our first crack at the two-minute summary. Uh, yes, sir. Well, again, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve on behalf of the citizens here for the last two years. And if it's your desire, I'm happy to go back to Raleigh and to continue to fight on your behalf. I hope you can see by this forum the questions asked and the answers given is that there is a distinct contrast in the choice that you will have to make as citizens. And just to provide further clarity of the principles that I stand on, in addition to actually the heart that I articulated today, is that I believe that there is a responsibility uh, for government. And I believe that each and one of us has rights that have given by an almighty God. And that those rights is what government was established to protect. I also believed in the responsibility to provide the privilege of education as articulated in our state constitution. I believe that government has a role to create an environment where jobs can grow, but it is wrong and improper to take your tax dollars outside of government's role and hand them out to a private business. I believe that government should provide the opportunities and the freedoms for us to be able to build on our family values and to be able to express our religious faiths freely. Uh, I hope you can see my heart and my desire for a government here in North Carolina that where we can be an example to the rest of the nation, that whenever government is limited to its proper role and whenever people are left to be free, people truly prosper. I'll continue to do what I've done in the past. I articulated to you in the same forum uh, principles two years ago. I took those same principles to Raleigh. I led on them. I voiced my concerns over them. I voted in the same manner, and I'm willing to be consistent again. We need, all across this state and all across our nation, individuals who are not focused on the next election, but are focused on the next generation. It's been an honor to serve these past two years. I humbly ask for your vote to go back to Raleigh and to continue to fight on your behalf. I'm Chris Millis, and I hope you would vote for me in this election. Thank you, Mr. Millis. Mr. Unger. Mr. Millis feels that the role of government should be much more limited than I do. Um, so we don't necessarily share that approach. But I would like to spend my time here telling you why I'm running. The big issues are education, making sure that our, our schools are properly funded, and our teachers are properly supplied with the resources they need, protecting the environment, protecting our streams, protecting our offshore waters, uh, protecting the air. Fracking will also create problems with air pollution. We didn't even talk about the methane or that kind of thing. So protecting the environment's a key issue. And the other one is jobs, whether it's attracting new jobs or it's keeping the jobs we have, that's, that's a big issue. And, and I, I want to focus on those three issues. I also want to tell you that when elected, if elected, however you want to say it, I will have to leave my job. I will have to leave my benefits. I'll have to go out in the brave new world and find another way to survive, and I'm sure I will. I'm sure I'll be able to do something to keep my head above water. But I'm, I'm running for state house to make this my full-time job to serve the people. Uh, I intend to open an office in my district that will be available for people to come see me. And um, I intend, just like I've done in other projects in my life, whether it was starting a newspaper, starting a sports program, uh, running a business, I'll put 150% effort into it, and I'll make people proud of the job I do for them. So when I say my campaign slogan, I will work for you, that's exactly what I'll do. It'll be a full-time thing, and, and I hope to make you proud. So um, I am asking for everyone's vote this fall. Um, we represent a different approach to government and a different approach to many issues. And I'm glad that we're both out here being able to express those differences and be able to take it to the voters for the voters to make a choice. Thank you for having us today. Thank you, gentlemen. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to the president of the chamber, uh, Lorette Legan. Say thank you to Mr. Mellis and Mr. Unger, number one, for joining us today, and number two, for your willingness to serve. I think you both are passionate, and it came through during the forum, so thank, thank you. I also want to thank the chamber staff that worked on this project. Our staff liaison for these forums is Janet Bowen. Uh, with us again, Teresa Carter, our Onslow County Tourism Director, and Don Jensen, our Military Affairs Director, helped with this program as well. Special thank you to our corporate sponsor, Duke Energy, our media sponsor, The Daily News, 
and the city of Jacksonville for the use of these wonderful facilities, the Jacksonville Media, Media Services for broadcasting this and rebroadcasting it for us all the way to Election Day, and the citizens that elected to be here with us for the forum. This concludes our program. Thank you.